My name is Ilyana Turmali and I will be talking about supporting sparse data in HD5. We received a small grant, a phase one uh, SBR uh, grant from DOE to investigate uh, changes to HD5 file format uh, APIs in the library to support sparse data in HD5. This work is in progress and I created already uh, uh, it is a discussion, uh, discussion topic issue at HDF group, uh, GitHub at HDF5 repo with the links to documents we already c uh, created with the changes, proposed changes to file format and to APIs. And the next document we'll be creating is a kind of overview of the changes that will be required to introduce this feature in HDF5. And this is a very good time for community if you're interested in sparse data uh, to give feedback so as many use cases we can cover and discuss uh, and uh, it will help us to finalize APIs and finalize changes to HD5 file format which surprisingly was not um, much rock after we did pretty lengthy thinking process so I will be talking about it. Um, so as you see my outline is very sparse so it's about sparse so what is sparse data? Really, you cannot find definition and it really kind of subjective topic. It's, uh, first of all, it's ubiquitous. Examples come from the experimental sciences and the computer modeling, high energy physics, neutron and X-ray scattering. Those were our first examples of uh, sparse data. And by the way, it was uh, demanded like many, many years ago. Our first really diving into sparse use case was at least seven years ago, so John will correct me. Mass spectrometry is a good example of experiments where data is um, um, sparse uh, and, and so on, including MR and machine learning applications. In, uh, so there's no really standard definition and then linear algebra data is considered sparse if less than 30% of matrix elements are non zeros. And in experimental sciences, the use cases we saw usually it is one tenth percent or up to 10 percent of gathered data is of interest, but it may contain a bigger percentage, as we'll see. And as I mentioned, our first motivation uh, case for sparse storage came from uh, LCLS uh, to um, experiment uh, use case. Uh, in the past, we were like, oh, you have sparse data, no problem, you just use compression. But what you were what you were doing with HD5, you were really saving a space, you're saving on um, I/O amount, but you were losing where your data is. So uh, we were told mm, it doesn't work for us. So and this is the use case that provided us with really most uh, complete requirements up to this point. And my goal here is to find more requirements and more use cases. So in uh, this uh, LCLC uh, LS, uh, use case, uh, there was experiment where uh, images are coming and um, it, it was each image contained a region of interest with, which was within 10% of image or it was very small subsequent lines of a uh, few points uh, in the image. Um, the number of size configurations and locations of these uh, regions of interest or the small subsections, uh, they were changing over time. And for each image, what was important to them, it was, first of all, it was possible to automatically identify those um, locations. And there was a desire to store only a uh, region of interest of those points list. And those locations must be recovered, both uh, the location and content of that region of interest. But every nth image, and it was specified, every nth image, we are taking the full image, we're storing the full image, but we still want to recover our uh, region of interest um, and point list for full dimensional images. Those images were stored in the three-dimensional HDF5 data set that was desired to store. So to meet the requirements, we propose to implement a sparse data sets and uh, where only the entries that have been written explicitly uh, are defined, and that's what we call defined elements. And um, you, uh, users should be able to read, uh, ident identify and read those elements. 
And beyond that, uh, there should be compatibility with the dense data sets, how your workflow, you're working with the current data sets, you should be able to work the same way with the dense data, uh, with the sparse data sets. And um, there should be ability to uh, re redefine defined values or erase defined values. And of course, uh, compression is very important. So compression should be, uh, and data filtering should be applied. Um, other use cases that I found beyond this, um, of course, it comes when you go to MRI, what is happening when you're sitting there for 40 minutes, uh, breathing, not breathing, they take very quick sequence of very low resolution images. And then there are reconstruction techniques to create a composite image that will allow you then to reconstruct very high resolution uh, time, time frames. Uh, there are many techniques, but uh, so all this six second opinion, because all of the techniques, as I learned, have artifacts. So never believe what you see. Sec second opinion is important. Uh, so this is one example of uh, another data, experimental data that is coming from the um, gathered together. Linear algebra. So you will ask me why, uh, why I need this. Um, as you know, for linear algebra, there are many algorithms that in memory you're using specific memory presentation to deal with um, sparse matrices. What sparse uh, storage will allow you to store that matrix uh, independently of how data is organized for this matrix in memory. And this is, I hope this will be important. As with so with AMR uh, methods, when you have the highest resolution uh, mesh, you really can store it in one data set and API will allow you to read the same mesh with different resolution by providing different selections. So you do not need to store stack of images. You can store one, uh, say like here, three dimensional data set. I'm not sure about unstructured meshes. I'm kind of naive about it. Uh, my understanding, I just took this example from Petsy tutorial where they describe uh, we have two triangles with the vertices, edges, and um, triangles numbered. And um, intuitively, the data set, when you describe a connectivity matrix between like, I have two triangles, zero and one, uh, number zero and one, and my vertices, uh, and the mesh will grow, it's clear that that connectivity uh, matrix will be um, sparse. Um, also, mesh can be represented as directed at cyclic graph where you have all elements numbered. And if I do a mistake, when I'm putting ones and zeros in my table, you really come up with describing connectivity uh, matrix for this directed at cyclic graph that describes the same mesh. Uh, it will be sparse. I'm not sure if it helps, so I will be more than, you know, I, I want to learn more and if it really can help us with the storage of. Um, meshes because one would think that when you add for example to this uh, triangle uh, another point and it becomes uh, say you know for, for for ages you disturb your mesh but you do not need to rewrite the whole mesh you can just add one element and connectivity matrix but as i said uh, i don't know so uh, looking at all those use cases uh, we started developing the concept of structured chunk Oh my gosh. So uh, the concept of structure chunk, we have a data set, as usual, you see that sparse matrix, and we uh, use uh, logically divided in chunks, but instead of storing the chunk as we do for dense data set, where each element is mapped to the storage, we're just storing uh, elements themselves and uh, their locations that HDF5 library allows us to serialize and really to store a serialized uh, hyperslab selection, which is surprisingly is very good uh, in applying when I apply compression. I had compression for for gigabyte chunk for diagonal. It was compressed that encoded selection uh, 600 times. So we came with this concept, okay, we will need to store encoded selections of defined elements. And since this is a data that allows us to find our elements, we should have checksum because if this data is corrupted, we will not be able to interpret uh, our, we'll have values of the elements, but we will not know where they are. So, okay, checksum is something important in this structured chunk, which has sections of storing encoded selection and then fixed, uh, fixed size data. For example, if we have 
or just integer data. We just need, uh, we know the size of that um, section. Then we start thinking, okay, if we have variable length data, it will not be enough for two sections. We need another section that will allow us to store length and uh, offsets into heap where, say, strings will be stored. So we came up with the more sections and required checksums once again so data is not corrupted. So by the end, we arrived with the new uh, generalized structured chunk layout that has different sections. I believe file format allows us to have up to 255 sections now, which kind of crazy, but why not? Uh, and uh, if section contains some kind of metadata to interpret data that is stored somewhere later in the chunk section, it will require ch a checksum. And chunk structured chunk metadata, it's offsets of sections uh, of each section. Uh, the same we can do with filtering. Um, we, will, we will have storing in filter structure chunk. Each section can be uh, compressed, and that will be reflected in the MPI and uh, corresponding changes to file format to find all filter uh, pipeline applied to each section. So the changes to APIs are actually minimum. Uh, the new functions to get defined um, uh, elements uh, be able to erase. Of course, we need new APIs for direct uh, writing direct chunks uh, because now chunk uh, has more sections and you have to describe and kind of assemble it. But uh, filtering functions that are available, we want to, we propose to um, uh, version them and the only change that really, uh, how it's versioned, uh, it will have a new parameter section number. And this is example of H5P set filter that uh, Quincy convinced me that I have to use the biggest data types uh, for the parameter, existing parameters and the new parameters and change data buffer just to provide any void buffer. So this is a proposed change to filtering function. I really encourage you to look at the document and see uh, if it works for you. Programming model, really nothing changed. You're using new, uh, old API to set new layout, sparse chunk, and the rest goes as is. You can apply compression. Uh, here, uh, I'm applying compression when, when I'm not specifying the section, it applies to all sections, and there are functions to remove a filter pipeline for some sections, uh, it's existing API. Or you can use special flags, for example, when we store sparse data to apply zeta, a gzip compression to the section that stores uh, serialized uh, encoding and um, uh, say a uh, zip filter for uh, data itself. Uh, so I want to acknowledge uh, Department of Energy who supported this work. If we do not get phase two, uh, documents, uh, design documents will be available to the community and uh, you're welcome to, uh, to work with us. If you have any questions, I will be happy to walk you through those documents. They're pretty lengthy. Um, I also want to thank HDF Group developers and Quincy with whom we have multiple discussions uh, and the um, result, I think, pretty good design. One thing I forgot to mention because I was rushing, I have one minute now. Um, if I go back to my slide, you can see if I have a variable link data and I just remove the section uh, sparseness, I have my now storage for variable link data that really allows me to compress variable length data. So we have new way with this new with this uh, concept of structured chunk, new way of storing uh, variable length data in HDF5, getting full um, advantage of applying compression to real values and not to uh, encoded offsets and uh, length or whatever it is, pointer, actually pointers to the heap. So uh, another option is, as you may notice, that we now can implement uh, with the structured chunk non-homogeneous arrays in HDF5, which every element of the array may have its own data type because we have the way to store this information with the elements themselves. So we personally think it is really, uh, I, li I like my design, so I like <laughs> So, so uh, thank you, uh, uh, questions.
and the uh, references you can find so they are on the slides. Yes. Yeah. Just a quick question. The, when is the metadata about the extra chunks parsed? Because one of the big differences to today when I store a sparse data set is that I create a ton of variables, which usually then just increases read time just on opening it, even if I'm not going into the variable or the sparse data set that I'm interested in. So is this delayed, basically, if I say, like, okay, if this one field and this is sparse, when I open the file, it's not really looking for all the chunks and trying to get them together. Or oh no no no! You will be able to open uh, the data set. You do not you even uh, do not need to know if it's sparse or not. You can find the properties, so it's completely transparent to the users. You will uh, you can define the, uh, you can find the properties that yes, it's sparse storage. And now I have opportunity to find which elements I define and do more man manipulations. Uh, and uh, metadata is stored. Uh, we're using the same indexing schemas for chunk indexing, so it is now stored in uh, so-called records, uh, it is documented. For example, we will be able uh, to read uh, for you uh, only uh, selections and not data itself. So doing much less I.O. so you can find points of interest and then read the data you need. And it all goes through regular HDF5 APIs using hyperslab selection. So it is space ID, uh, memory ID, those things, you will see it in the document. Okay, just a quick follow-up, can I design like fill values for data that's not there if I want to select a hyperslab? Oh yeah, yeah, it's, it stays the same, yeah. Everything stays the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should probably remember this, but what happens if you create a uh, sparse uh, data set and then you use just regular HRD write with the selection? Uh, it will uh, write your selection. Uh, but it will write, uh, so it will be defined selection. If you, um, uh, you, are, you are not defining it as a sparse? Yeah, if you, if you just are using an existing application, just write, you know, use the existing APIs to write to a hyperslab or something. Or uh, but they just said the sparse, the created said, the sparse. So you just use it regular HRD, right? Oh, it, it's the same, uh, but, but a sparse storage underneath will be used. Sorry. So. It will uh, define new defined elements. So it'll automatically create the uh, structure chunk? Yeah. No, structure chunk is creation property. So if you create your data set as structured, uh, structured chunk, then you use your regular APIs. And when you do H5D write, with the, you even can populate all sparse chunks. Uh, sparse chunks, it will be dense storage but used by uh, sparse storage. So you will have all selections or each, each point selected and each data value stored. So you can store dense, dense data set in sparse chunk. So if you use just HRD write, it'll create uh, dense data or it'll create... It will create a structured chunk with the locations of the elements you're writing yeah. and with the values of those elements. So mm -hmm. what, what's the difference? No, no, that, uh, that API was for uh, direct chunk write, write struct chunk. It is direct, uh, you know, we have H5D write direct, right? Those are new APIs for to write direct structured chunk. So it is in user space to construct, to provide us all buffers and all information, and we will write that structured chunk directly by passing HDF5 or IO pipeline. Yes. What? All the information is Oh, we're not converting. We we can convert, but we are not converting. It's up to users. So, as I said, you you look at this matrix, and you do not want to store really what you are interested in storing on the values that you are interested in. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm clear about all that. All that is, is that the data always distributed to zero, or is it distributed to all that? Uh, okay. So there is no, uh, when you write this ch chunk, you know, upper left chunk, right? What will be written is the encoded selection of the 
grid, uh, grid, uh, grid uh, um, rectangle and the values. Cool. So, but what happens if it's a zero by one by? Where? So, oh, if you if you read, if you read it back, it will populate those with uh, field values. The, the, uh, uh, but let, let's talk offline. I, I don't think, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. um, can I use each part of path to change the data set? Yes, um, um, uh, RFC contains the whole section discussion about the tools, uh, changes to the tools needed, and uh, it is just outlined. It will require much more work because tools will require some work, but absolutely, H5D should be modified, H5 repack, change the type of storage because it's really what we're talking about. It's a type of storage, how data is stored on disk. It's transparent in terms of APIs. You can still use regular APIs to work with the sparse, uh, 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 with, uh, with the uh, data sets that use a structured chunk storage. Thank you.